That's what will be today, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 14. We've been going through 2 Timothy. We took a break there for the Easter time. And uh, Pastor Christian, thank you for preaching last week. We were away at a Worldview weekend. Pastor Danny and myself took our 12th graders, our graduates from high school, and spent a weekend with them with eight hours of intensive uh, teaching to prepare them, hopefully to prepare them uh, for college to come. So it was a great weekend uh, we had with them uh, as well. Thank you for praying for us. Our women are away this weekend. Hopefully you've been praying for them. I know that they're having a blessed time there at Camp Hebron. Continue to pray for them as they wrap up their session uh, today as well. And uh, us husbands will be happy to see, fathers will be happy to see them uh, home this afternoon. You can turn it back over to them when they get home, so it'll be good. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 to 26, we're going to finish our chapter today. And the theme of today is the approved worker. You know, Paul is writing, again, just to refresh you, we haven't been in Timothy for a couple weeks now, to, to refresh you, 2 Timothy is written by the Apostle Paul from prison. He's in prison, he's been tried, and he has been found guilty, and he's awaiting execution. And the last thing that he is doing before he meets his Lord and Savior in the clouds in heaven is to prepare his young protege, his young son in the faith, Timothy, to carry on his work. Timothy is the pastor of Ephesus. He's a young pastor. He feels overwhelmed. He feels uh, afraid a bit, a bit timid, a bit fearful. He has big shoes to fill, and he's, he, he's, he's feeling a, a bit fearful of this task he has before them. And, and Paul is writing 2 Timothy to Timothy to encourage him, to build him up, to challenge him, to instruct him, to, instruct him to, to be the pastor that he needs to be. Chapter 1 that we went through there, we saw some of Timothy's feelings. Paul is challenging him to uh, respond to his call, to walk in, in, in the calling that God has placed on him, to see his true identity in Christ, to take comfort in that, to not have a spirit of fear but of power. Chapter 2, the Apostle Paul opens up and comparing Timothy's uh, calling to, to that of, of, of really three pictures of a soldier, of an athlete, and of a farmer. He's using them as metaphors of, 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 of Timothy's mission, his commission, his calling before him to be like a soldier, to be like an athlete, to be like a farmer. Well, today as we finish off chapter 2, he's going to give him another picture, uh, another picture for, for Timothy, and it's a picture of a worker, a worker, an approved worker. Okay, this is, this is talking to, to Timothy as a believer. He is already approved in Christ. He is a child of God. He is accepted unconditionally. He is saved. But now, as he is fulfilling his calling before God, is he approved? Is his working approved unto God? That's what we're going to look at today and see from this scripture how we too can be approved workers unto God. So let's read together. I'm going to start in 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 14, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. Uh, this is God's Word. Verse 14. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Verse 15. This is our key today. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened, and they are upsetting the faith of some. But God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal... The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Now in a great house there are, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some of these vessels are for honorable use, and some are for dishonorable use. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy and useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Verse 22, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must be not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, 
and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. This is God's word for us today. Let's go before him now and ask him to bless our time. Heavenly Father, we pray now that you would come to us and send your Holy Spirit to us, Lord, that he might illuminate our hearts and minds to understand your holy word, Lord. May we interact with the words on the page, and may they be more than just words on a page. May they be your very voice to us, your instructions to us on how to be an approved worker, how to live correctly and victoriously as a Christian in this dark world. Help us today to be approved workers, Lord. Lord, be with those today that cannot be with us. Bless them, strengthen them, Lord. Heal them, Lord. Those who are on the women's retreat, bless them even now as they gather around your word and and share your word this morning. Lord, bless their time together. Instruct them, guide them, Lord. May this weekend for our women be an amazing weekend. May it be a watershed weekend, Lord, where you change many lives, Lord. And change our lives today, Lord, as we interact with your word. Lord, I pray that your blessing would remain upon us today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, as many of you know, we have a a Wednesday night program here for our our youngsters, for our our children, that we call Awana. You know that program, your kids have been in that program, your kids may be in that program right now, and it's a a fantastic program, and the word Awana means, it's an acronym that means approved workmen are not ashamed. Approved work when I say comes right from this verse of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. And again, I really timed these sermons wrong because we had an Awana week here at church about a month ago, which would have fallen great on this week, but it didn't work out that way. So sorry. So, but this is their theme verse, and this is what Wednesday nights are about. Making sure our young people, our children of David's, are approved unto God by, and this is how you become approved unto God, by rightly handling the word of truth. You become an approved workman by rightly handling God's word. That's what Awana is about. That's what Paul is writing to Timothy here in in, in 2 Timothy. To become an approved worker, to rightly handle God's word, to know it, to study it, to love it, to read it, to memorize it, to live your life by it. We want to be an approved worker. This is our goal as, as believers. Now, this is written to Christians If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, your goal is to be an approved worker. To be an approved worker. You don't work your way into salvation, we know that. It's not being an approved worker so that you're saved. This is after salvation if you know Jesus. Are you approved by God? Do you have God's seal of approval on your life as a believer? Let's look at those two words in introduction. What does approved mean? Approved work. Approved means that you are officially accepted. You, are, you have been tested. You have been proved. You have been qualified. You are a known commodity. You've been tested and tried, and you've been approved officially, in this case, by God. This is part of the human condition. When you think of approval, every single human being on planet Earth is looking for Approval. This is something that is bound up in the heart of every human being. We want approval. Since the day we're born as children to the day we die, we are looking for validation. We are looking for justification. We are looking for forgiveness. We are looking for approval and acceptance in this world, aren't we? That's what human life is about. Looking for someone to tell you it's okay. Your life's okay. You're headed in the right direction. You're doing this right. You're going to be all right. Approval. We're all looking for acceptance, we're all looking for love, we're all looking for approval. We we look to our parents for approval. Some of you have have never felt or known the the approval of your parents and it's messed up you up for the rest of your life. Your parents may may be gone, they may have passed away, but still you long for that approval you never had of your parents. Maybe it's from peers, maybe it's from another family member, maybe it's from your spouse. You have been dying for your husband to approve of you, to accept you, or your, or, or, or your wife, and you've, you've never had that. We're looking for approval. When you really think about this concept of, of how we're trying to find approval, you'll find that almost everything in your life comes down to wanting to be approved. Even simple things. The clothes you wear a lot of times, you pick out of your closet, or you pick it by because you think it'll give you approval by someone. I dress a certain way to to please a certain person, to approve a certain person. My career choices, my goals in life, how I parent, how I choose to present myself, what I wear, how I act, what I say is all done for the express reason to get approval from somebody. This is how we live. This is how a lot of people live, looking for approval. 
But here's the truth as a Christian, as a believer in Jesus Christ, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, you are approved and accepted by Jesus Christ. You need to look no further than Jesus Christ and his death on a cross for your approval. He's accepted you unconditionally. He's approved you unconditionally. This is the doctrine we call justification, that in him, through, through Jesus' life, you have found approval in the only person it accounts with, and that's God the Father. You have been approved. Stop looking to be approved and validated in this world. Stop it. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you have no business looking for approval in the things of this world. Stop being a man pleaser. Stop looking for the approval of of people and look to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He approves of you if you are a believer today. Everything we do is about seeking God's approval, not man's approval. My, My preaching today, every Sunday I get up here, I'm not looking to be approved by you. It feels good to be approved by people. That's why we look for it. It feels good when you walk out and you give me a pat on the back and say, that's the best sermon I ever heard. Wow, that makes me feel really good there. Thank you. Thank you. feels really crummy when you say, man, you really missed the mark. That was a terrible sermon today. You stink. You stink as a preacher. You're long-winded. You say things. You repeat them. Man, I don't know what you're talking about half the time. You know, but, but I'm not here for your approval. I'm here for God's approval. That's why I stand here. And your life as well, when you go to your work and you go before the roles that God's placed in your life, you are looking for God's approval, not for man's approval. Stop living for man's approval. Because you know as well as I do, man's approval and God's approval are often in conflict, aren't they? And the great task of the American Christian has tried to reconcile these two and bring them together. We want to be approved by man and man's system in the world, and we want to be approved by God. That's our goal as American Christians, to try to do both of those things. And we live that way, with one foot in man's approval and one foot in God's. Isn't that a great way to live? Where everybody, God and everybody around us, tells us how great we are. It's impossible to live that way. You've got to pick one or the other. Don't try to live for both. We are approved by God. And now that we are believers, we want to live in that approval. And we're a worker. What, what's been approved is our work as a believer. Our work is what is approved. We are saved and justified. We are proved before we are a child of God. But now that we're a child of God, we want our work, what we do for Christ, to be approved, to be pleasing to him. We want God to bless our work. We want God to smile upon us on what we're doing for him. We want to live a life of blessing in accordance with his will. We want to be a worker approved. We're, again, I, I'm, I'm going to say this several times today because this is so clear. You're not saved by works. I'm not saying that if you're a good worker and you're approved by God, then you'll be saved. This happens after salvation. But once we are saved as believers in Jesus Christ, we want to live a life worthy of the calling that God's placed on our life. We're saved by grace through faith. This is not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. It's not by works so that no one can boast. But Ephesians 2.10 then tells us, but now that we are saved, we are what? His workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, that he's prepared beforehand that we might walk in them. You are God's workmanship. He's working on you, and you are working out your salvation with fear and trembling. We're saved to work for Jesus. We're not saved by our work. We are saved to work for Jesus. So what's the application? It's very simple. Let's get to work, people. Let's get to work. Let's work hard at this thing we call Christianity and we call faith. Let's work at this. And our main work as Christians is the work we do in God's word. The main work that you are called to do as a believer in Jesus Christ, there's a lot of things God calls you to do, but the main work that you've called to do before all other works that's primary to every other thing you will do for Jesus Christ is the work you are called to do in God's word. You are workers in God's word first And foremost, that's how you become approved unto God, according to verse 15. How do you become approved? That you rightly handle the word of God. Approved workers, approved Christians that are working for God, the first and primary characteristic of that work is that you work hard and diligently in the word of God. Does everybody get that? Say amen if you get that. I, you saved some amens from last week, right? Christian had you amen in and doing stuff. So that's, that's you saved at least one for me, hopefully, this week. Do you understand that? This is the work that God's called you to if you're a Christian, to work hard and diligently to pour your life out and your energies out and your time and your resources out into God's word. 
That's your primary work. There's nothing more important than that as a believer in Jesus Christ. You will never be approved unto God as a Christian if you don't know God's word. You will be not an approved worker, you will be an ashamed worker. And when you stand before God one day, you will get into heaven. You're a believer in Jesus Christ. But you'll be ashamed on that day when your work is burned up, when your works and the things you've done for God face the fire and you have nothing left to show. Wood, hay, and stubble. That's all you brought to heaven with you. Wood, hay, and stubble that got burned up on, in judgment. We will be judged as Christians, not for salvation, but for our works. Are you bringing precious treasure to heaven, the works that you've done for God through his word, or are you bringing wood, hay, and stubble? Are you an approved worker, or are you an ashamed worker? Well, Paul gives Timothy five traits uh, of an approved worker in this passage, and we're going to go through them, we're going to try to go through them quickly, and, and then we're going to apply them to our lives. The first thing, if you want to be an approved worker, the first thing is do you keep your focus on the word of God. And, and unfortunately, I'm sorry I didn't get that, the notes on the app. My computer was not cooperating this week. So you'll have to go the old school way if you're taking notes and, and use, add the bulletin. But normally they're on the app, but I didn't get them on there this week. Um, approved workers keep their focus on God's word. There is so much this world is designed to distract us from the things of God, distract us from God's word. Everything in this world, no matter how neutral you may think it is, now, good it may be is designed to keep you out of God's word. This week, many of you spent three hours somewhere, more than three hours somewhere, probably three and a half hours, maybe more. If you got there early, you probably spent four hours in a movie house. That's what they used to call it in the old days. When I grew up, you weren't allowed to go to movie houses. It's different now. It's the kind of church I grew up in. You were in a movie theater this week watching the greatest movie that's ever been made, that's made the most amount of money out of any movie that's ever been made in the history of humanity came out this last week. It's already made over a billion dollars in one week. And some of you were in a movie theater because you just had to see it. Some of you had to be, see it the night it opened. Some of you, like me, that are halfway out of your mind, went there at like midnight and stayed up till three o'clock in the morning. The latest I've stayed up in about 20 years just to watch this stupid thing. So you end up in a, in, a, in a movie theater for three and a half to four hours watching a movie that you just had to see, right? But have you spent three hours in God's word this week? Have you spent three hours studying God's word? Have you spent time memorizing and reading God's word? You got no problem watching a movie for three hours. But why can't we spend three hours in God's Word? I'm not even talking about one day. I'm talking about over the course of a week can you spend three hours in God's Word. Keep your focus on God's Word. Because there's so much we can get distracted with. Paul gives us three things we get distracted with. Number one, we get distracted about words. We quarrel about words. We get down into the minutia and we get distracted. Distracted, and, 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 it's, and it's a dangerous distraction. Verse 14, remind them of these things. Verse 14, remind, and charge them before God not to quarrel about words. That does no good. It just ruins hearers. Stay out of the peripheral. Keep the core things the core things. Keep the basics the basics. The main things are the important things. Keep them the main things. Keep them central. Don't fight over minutia. Don't waste your time picking apart words. I shared this article with you on, on Easter, but, but I want to reiterate, uh, the New York Times did an interview with Union, the, the, the seminary, New York City Union Seminary, interviewed the president on Easter morning about the resurrection, and, and this, the, the president, this woman, said she doesn't believe in miracles, she doesn't believe Jesus was born by a virgin, doesn't believe Jesus really rose from the dead, doesn't believe in the inspiration of the Bible, right? She, she says, none of that is true, we're, 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 we're beyond all that, but she's still training people to be pastors in liberal churches around America, right? But she doesn't believe anything that the Bible teaches, really, I don't know what she's doing there, but that's what she said, but I guarantee she's probably one of the most educated people when it comes to the Bible you've ever met. And I guarantee she can quarrel with you for days on end about words. She could probably read the Greek. She could probably read the Hebrew. She could probably read the Aramaic. And she could probably sit there and give, her, give, her, give you hours and hours of useless academic information about the Bible and where it came from. And words. And Greek words. But she doesn't believe Jesus rose from the dead. What good is that? Not only is that no good to her, you know what the Bible says? It says it leads to nothing good, but it also leads to the ruin of hearers. Every single student that sits under her seminary and her ministry is being ruined by her and her teaching. Being ruined. 
being led farther and farther astray from the true gospel. That's what happens when you get down into the minutia and you make the, 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 the little things primary things. What does it say in verse 14? Remind them of what? These things. What are these things? Don't quarrel about words, but remind them, Timothy, of these things. Well, these things are the things he just talked about, the verses before this. Verse 8 to verse 13 are about the gospel. Remember, verse 8 says, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, seminary, university, president, whatever your name is. Remember this. He is risen from the dead. He's the offspring of David. He preached in my gospel. Remind them of these things, the gospel. Timothy, you will never in your ministry get beyond the basics, which is Jesus Christ risen from the dead, offspring of David, alive and coming again. Preach the gospel. The plain things are the main things. Okay, the plain things are the main things. I'm not up here giving you secret knowledge or secret codes. You've got to decipher and figure out and go home and do little secret puzzles to figure out God's truth. The main things are the plain things. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't quarrel about words. Stick to the basics. The gospel. I had a, I had a man in my last church come up to me and he said to me, he goes, you know, um, every week it's the gospel with you. You know, do you ever do anything else? Do you ever not preach the gospel? I said, let me tell you something, pal. When you believe in the gospel, then I'll stop preaching the gospel. Okay, it's the main, that's the main thing. Timothy, Alan, David's church, this is true for all of us. Don't quarrel about words. Secondly, he says, don't get, avoid irreverent babble. Irreverent babble, verse 16. Avoid irreverent babble. The word irreverent means profane, means godless, and babble means babble, nonsense. Avoid godless nonsense. Godless nonsense has no business being in the church of Jesus Christ. And yet, oh my goodness, we bring, we bring godless nonsense into the church all the time. What does it lead to? It leads to more ungodliness, verse 16. If you read on, this, this irreverent Bible leads, will lead people into more and more ungodliness, further and further away from godliness, and their talk spreads like gangrene. Here's two examples, Harmanius and Philetus. Famous or infamous false teachers in the church of Ephesus that are spreading irreverent babble. They've swerved from the truth, verse 18. They're saying the resurrection has already happened. They're upsetting the faith of some. They've gone from irreverent babble, godless babble, into heresy in this church. Avoid them. Stay away from them. These two men, Paul names. Paul has no problem naming names. Every chapter in 2 Timothy, he names names. These are the ones I'm talking about, Harmanius and Philetus. What they do, they, they swerve from the truth. They've allowed not irreverent babble into the church, into their teaching. They swerve from the truth. We don't know exactly what their swerve was, but I guarantee it was probably pretty subtle when it started out. I talk a lot about the, the danger of the one degree, sitting under teaching that's off by one degree picking up a Christian book or listening to a Christian preacher that's just off by one degree. He's not a heretic, but he's just, just a little off. And over time, that one degree gets bigger and bigger, and eventually you're in heresy. Maybe that's, the, maybe that's how they swerved. Maybe they overemphasized certain truths in the Bible at the, at the, and forgot about other truths. They didn't, treat, they didn't teach the full gospel of the Bible. They didn't go through the Bible. They got on pet peeves. They kept hammering certain things at the expense of other things. That's a way that you swerve from the truth. Maybe they came in and taught godless philosophy and psychology and self-help nonsense, and they couched it and put it in, the, in, in gospel terms. And you went every Sunday, and you heard another self-help sermon, and you thought you were hearing the gospel, and you were just hearing works. That happens a lot. How to do this, how to be this, how to have a successful marriage. Let me give you five things that you can find on the internet or you can find in any self-help marriage book that you can find and I'll throw a couple verses on it and you think you just got preached to. What you did is they swerved from the truth. There's a lot of ways that this happens. Some people stand before you and they preach opinion. They don't preach the Bible. That's swerving from truth. Many churches today are swerving from the truth, getting caught up in things that are peripheral. And when you get caught up in those things, eventually those things will lead to heretical views. Be careful. They swear from the truth. The second thing is they begin to deceive their, their hearers. What they say, the fullness, uh, verse 18, they deceive them by saying that the, the resurrection had already happened. The resurrection's already happened. What's the resurrection that we're waiting for? The resurrection is the fullness of life, our fullness of our spiritual life. 
That's what we're waiting for, right? That, that's, the, that's the good day. That's the, the end day when we are resurrected, when we are delivered from this body of death and sin, and we are delivered from sin, and we're in, in the fullness of life, right? The resurrection. They're saying that's already come. You meant, it's already come. You already have what? The fullness of life. You already have God's full spiritual life. You know what we call that today? There's a name for it. It's called name it and claim it. That's what we call it. You've already experienced your best life now. That, that's what this is. That's the, the heretical teaching that you already should be walking in the fullness of your spiritual life. No, we are waiting from the resurrection. We are delivered from sin and death, and we stand before Jesus Christ full and satisfied on that day. We're not there yet. We haven't got to the fullness yet. But those who tell you that you can name and claim and God wants you healthy, wealthy, and wise, and all those things, they're, they're falling in the same trap, the same false teaching that Harmanius and Philetus were teaching. Stay away from that. Because what happens when you swear from the truth and you begin to deceive people with heresies, guess what? That kind of teaching spreads like gangrene. Now, gangrene, I don't, you know, I was going to put a picture of gangrene up here, but I said, I better not. It'll really gross people out. It'll be gross, grosser than those bad jelly beans they ate uh, last week. What flavor is that? Oh, I got the grand, gangrene flavor. That would, that would really be rough. That would really be rough. This teaching spreads because false teachers are always cults of personality. They're always very, very charismatic and draw people to themselves. Charismatic, not in Christian sense, but in the, the word sense. I don't want you to think, you know. But the, they draw people. And their teaching spreads like gangrene through books, through videos, through the internet, through, through preaching, through all these ways. And before you know it, they prey on immature, weak Christians. They pack churches, they pack conferences, and their teaching spreads like gangrene. There's nothing more dangerous than false teachers in the church that swerve from the truth. Don't be distracted. Thirdly, he says, don't, don't have anything to do with ignorant controversies, foolish and ignorant controversies, nonsense babble, uh, nonsensical babble, foolish, ignorant controversies. This leads to division in the church. Verse 23. Skip all the way down to verse 23. Again, he comes back to this. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels, and quarrels breed division. The book before, 1 Timothy chapter 6, he talks about these people, and he says this, if anyone teaches, this is 1 Timothy 6, 3, if anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord and Jesus, Jesus Christ, and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and he understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words. This is what he's talking about here in 2 Timothy 2. And what do they do? They produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and depraved of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. It creates division in the church. Stay away from these things. Don't engage these people. Don't engage controversy. Don't engage quarrels over words. Don't engage a godless nonsense. Don't engage ignorant controversies. Instead, you are not to engage them. You are to rebuke them. They are to be rebuked. You don't argue with the devil when he shows up. You rebuke the devil. That, that's where Adam and Eve messed up. That, that what we owe the devil is a rebuke. We don't argue. We don't enter into debate. You'll always lose that debate with the devil. You rebuke the devil. You rebuke false teachers. You rebuke false teachers. And you call them to repentance. We see that in verse 25. That God may grant repentance to these people. That's our goal. You rebuke and you call them to repentance. Keep your focus on the word of God. Educate yourself as a Christian. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful what books you read. Test everything. Use some discernment. Get on the internet. Research some people. You know, you know what one of the best researches is, is? Is pick up their Twitter feed. Because people say things in Twitter they'll never say anywhere else. Pick up their Twitter feed. See what these people are saying about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do some research. Use some discernment. Keep your focus on the word of God and those who preach the word of God and teach the word of God. Approved workers keep their focus on God's word. Secondly, approved workers rightly handle the word of truth. Here's our main point. Approved workers rightly handle God's word. Verse 15, do your best. Study to show yourself approved unto God, the King James says. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. How do we handle God's truth? You want to be approved, right? You want to handle God's word correctly, rightly, right? Well, number one, you do your best. You do your best. You diligently go before God's word consistently 
and you do your best. You study diligently. You read diligently. You memorize. You work hard at this. You don't come before God's word with a spirit of apathy or a spirit of, well, when I get to it. If I have time, I'll read God's word. That's not the spirit you come to it. That's not doing your best. What if you handled God, what if you worked in God's word like you work at your secular job? How long would you be employed if the same fervency and dedication you put into Bible study was the same kind of fervency and dedication you put into your secular job? How long would you last? Well, I'll do that when I, tell that to your boss. I'll get to that when I feel like it. See how he, how he would approve of you then. You won't be getting a lot of approval from your boss if that's the way you work at your job. And yet that's how a lot of us work at God's word. Do your best. How hard do you work at studying God's word? How hard do you work at this thing? Secondly, you present yourselves to God for approval. We work in the word and we present ourselves to God to be approved. Am I working for God's approval in his word? Does God approve of how I'm handling God's word? Is he approving of how I'm going before his word? I get the picture of, of, you know, and I never was in boot camp, so this may be Hollywood. I don't know. Some of you were in boot camp, but I get the picture of that daily inspection you had. You had to get out in front of your, your cot there, and you better make sure everything in your, 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 your little area there was perfect, right? And he bounced that quarter off the, the, the bed, right? And if it didn't bounce, the, the, he just, he'd go like this, and he'd rip everything out, and you had to start over again. You're not approved. You haven't been approved by your drill sergeant. You haven't presented yourself in such a way for approval. Well, what if God did that? Now, God loves us as a father, but we are also seeking his approval as his children. Are we studying to show ourselves approved? Are we able to be approved by God in how we handle his word? Thirdly, we cut God's word straight. We cut it straight. This is hard. We handle God's word correctly. We divide the word of truth. That's the word of the King James. It means we cut it straight. We don't haphazardly cut at this thing. We don't jump around in the Bible and try to find verses that fit, our, fit what we want it to say. We don't proof text things. We cut it straight. We teach the whole counsel of God's word. And there's a lot of things in God's word, especially in this culture, that aren't very popular right now. And I don't think they're ever going to be popular again. But it's our goal, and it's your goal as a, as a student of, of God's word to be an approved worker, that you handle God's word correctly and rightly, even and especially in the hard stuff. In the hard stuff. That's where, that's where handling rightly is hard. We don't, we don't carelessly go before God's word. We're under such pressure to change things. Change God's word. It was written 2,000 years ago. Come on, man. We know so much more than they knew. We're more enlightened. We're smarter. We're more intelligent. Get with the program. You're such a fundamentalist. You're such an old timer with that Bible. You're such a bigot and a hater. You hate everybody and use your Bible as your means of hatred. That's what we hear now. And we are going to hear it more and more if you decide to handle God's word rightly. The pressure on us to change God's word is tremendous and only growing. Cultural pressure plus lazy Bible study leads to shame, leads to an ashamed worker. And that's what most churches are under. This incredible pressure to change God's word. USA Today, just last week, USA did an article, one of their main articles. American churches must reject literalism and admit we got it wrong on gay people. Churches have to change what God says about sexuality and stop taking the Bible so stinking literally and realize we got it wrong on human sexuality, on gender on all these things. You got it wrong, man. It's 2,000 years ago. They didn't know about these things. We got we to rightly handle God's word. Not in an abusive way. Not in an angry way. Not in a, not in a finger-pointing way. But in a loving way. We're going to see that later on. That approved workers, they teach and correct kindly and gently. They separate the person from the sin. We're all sinners. Oh my goodness. Every single one of us, we're in the same boat. Doesn't matter what your sin is. Doesn't matter what it is, we're all sinners. We all struggle. We're all broken, we're all messed up. But just because we're messed up, we can't go to the Bible and say, you know what, I don't like that the Bible keeps telling me I'm messed up. I don't like that the Bible keeps telling me I'm a sinner. I'm gonna change this one so I'll be accepted. It doesn't work that way. We have to rightly handle God's word, truth, and that's not easy to do. We're under great temptation to fit our culture into our Bible. We have to handle God's word correctly, even when it's hard. You ever have to share with someone that they're going to hell if they don't know Jesus? That's hard to do. That's not fun to do. 
Don't you just sort of want to forget that part and say, well, I'll just leave that part out. That's the ugly part. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're on your way to hell. That's hard to say to people in this culture. Who are you? Who do you think you are? Well, you're so smart. Who? You got it all figured out. You're going around pointing fingers, and you're just telling who's going to hell and what sins. You, that's for you to do. No, it's, I don't do that. The Bible does that. And I'm just sharing you what the scriptures say. It's getting harder and harder to share biblical truth, but we have to rightly handle God's word. Are you handling God's word correctly? Are you? Are you growing in it? Do you know it? You know, we, I give these resources all the time. I love to point them out because we are a Bible church, and, and we, we, if you're new to our church, uh, you need to know we're a Bible church. We, we stick to the Bible. We don't, we, want, we don't want to go any further than that. And we try to give you resources to study God's Word. There's some brochures in the hallway there that you can pick up how to study your Bible. If you take this to heart and say, no, I'm not studying my Bible. I'm not handling it correctly. Here's a brochure. How can I study my Bible? Simple method to do it. Uh, the challenge of this year, 2019, is that we, we memorize 100 verses out of God's Word. It's not too late to pick up this brochure and begin to memorize along with uh, David's church the, the, the Scriptures. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Start studying God's Word. Maybe you, you haven't read God's Word. You don't know the, the plan of, of God's Word. We have another uh, resource, re, uh, the, uh, the hundred essential passages in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation give you an overview of the whole Bible. Maybe you don't know. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe you don't know. Who comes first? Noah or Moses or David or, or I don't even know my chronological order of these things. The hundred most important. You can pick this up. And every single one of you should have a study Bible. A study Bible um, that, 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 that will, will give you information so you go deeper into God's Word. And uh, we have the opportunity, we have, we have some study Bibles that we give away. If you want one, um, we have to order some more, but, but a very simple study Bible. You leave this at home, you study, you read in this, and you maybe have a different Bible you bring to, to church, or you can even bring your big Bible to church, that's fine too. But, but you need a study Bible. If you're going to rightly handle God's Word, if you're going to be serious about God's Word, you need to get some resources, you need to plan. Cut it straight. Handle it correctly. You can't do it haphazardly. Get a study Bible. There are a lot of other resources that we can go, go through, and I've done that before, but, but you get my drift that, that we need to handle God's word correctly. The approved worker rightly handles God's word. Thirdly, the approved worker stand on solid theology. Stand on th solid theology. We love theology here at David's Community Bible Church. We love to go deep into God's word. We love the big words of theology and we love to tear them apart. And we love to teach those things. And look what it says in verse 19. Paul talks about two very important foundations that, that our faith is built on. Verse 19, God's firm foundation stands bearing these two seals. The Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Iniquity is another word for sin. There's two theological ter terms he's referring to. Number one is justification. Justification. It says that's the, that's the first seal. The Lord knows those who are his. The sovereignty of God and salvation. That he has chosen us. He has elected us out of this word by his grace and his favor. He has given to us and his forgiveness. He has chosen us. He has saved us. We have been granted repentance. Verse 25. In God's mercy, he has chosen us and saved us. God knows those who are his. That's justification. And then secondly, the second foundation is sanctification, which is a word that means growth and holiness. Those who know Jesus Christ will what? Turn from sin. Now, I, I like to say that that's a one-time thing. Boom, turn from sin, it's all done. You're done. Hey, I did it. Yeah, I got saved. Turn from sin. No, this is a continual process, our sanctification. Some of us, and I don't want to discourage you today, some of us will struggle with the same sin for the rest of our lives. It's a battle we have. It's something we're going to have to fight. That's part of our growth and holiness. That's part of sanctification. But Christians, once we are saved, must continually turn from their sin, must continually be leaving their sin. Salvation necessarily leads to holiness, practical holiness. You know, sometimes we forget about holiness and we, we tend to de-emphasize it. We love to emphasize grace and love, and we should emphasize that, but we should never emphasize grace at the expense of holiness. It's not grace versus holiness. They're together. They work together. God accepts us. He loves us unconditionally, loves us, but that doesn't get us off the hook from maturity in our faith and growing in holiness. 
approved workers. They know their theology. They know what God has called them to. You mess up these two words, you mess up justification, sanctification, you messed up all of Christianity. You messed up all of Christianity. In fact, these two words get jumbled and mixed up in many huge churches, many denominations, can't get these straight. And because they can't get these two things straight, they are preaching a false gospel. It's how important it is. Approved workers, they know their theology. They know the truth of God's word. They know how to handle God's word. Fourthly, approved workers are useful to the master. Verse 20. Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are honorable, some are dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy and useful for the master, ready for every good work. We are the vessels. He's talking about us. We're we're vessels and there's some for honorable use and some for dishonorable use. And it's interesting here because he says you need to cleanse yourself. Now let's back up a minute on this because again, this is the difference between justification and sanctification. In salvation, Christ cleanses us. You can't clean yourself. Goodness gracious, no you can't. But he's not talking about salvation here. You are, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are absolutely cleansed, forgiven. There's not a spot or wrinkle. There's not a stain on you. There's not a sin that's on your account anymore. You've been forgiven totally and absolutely. You are cleansed completely, okay? Because you're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. But he's not talking about our justification, our salvation. He's talking about our sanctification. Now that you're a Christian, are you walking? Are you walking in holiness? Are you a clean vessel? Are, are you walking in, in holiness? Are you growing? Are you making your, your cleansing, your, your, your holiness real in your life? Are you living it out? Well, how do you live it out? Well, here, you, you empty out, a vessel empties out. And verse 22 it says, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteous faith, love, and peace along with those who call the name of the Lord from a pure heart. So he gives us two ideas that mean the same thing. You empty out as a vessel or you flee from something. The Christian life is a life of emptying out and fleeing from something. You are emptying out sin and you are fleeing from sin. Whatever that may be, you are continually running from sin and emptying out sin in your life. Okay? These youthful passions. They are, they are being cleansed. You are cleansing yourself by not allowing sin to take foothold in your life as a Christian. And, and don't just think of sins like immorality and greed and those things. That he, but also think of sins of the mind. You know, this all is about handling God's word correctly. Well, well, well part of the sins is, is falling for false ideas and false theologies. And getting led astray in our thinking and our theology. So empty those things out. Flee from those things. And while you're emptying out those things and fleeing from those things, on the other hand, you're to pursue righteousness and faith and peace. You're to pursue godliness. And you're to fill your life with godliness. So it's a process. It's a process of continually, every day, emptying yourself out of sin. And your temptations and the struggles that you struggle with, we all are unique in those areas. We all have our thing that we fill up every day. And we say, oh man, I did it again. Let me empty that out. Let me fill that back up with righteousness and with godliness and goodness. And the joy of the Lord. Let me keep putting that in every day. And you keep running from those sins. You know what your sins are. Those sins who easily ensnare you. They come after you. And they struggle. You run from them. But while you're running, you're not just running aimlessly. You're pursuing righteousness. You're pursuing godliness in your life. You're filling yourself up. You're pursuing those things. And you know what I love about this? This process of emptying and and fleeing and filling and pursuing, it says at the end of verse 22, it says that we flee youthful passions and we pursue righteous faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the name from a pure heart. We're doing this together. You know, the, the, the church of, uh, at, David's, at David's Community Bible Church, we're all doing this to some degree, or we should be doing this to some degree, emptying and, and fleeing and filling up and pursuing, and we're doing it together. We're running together. You know, you, you can't beat sin in your life by yourself. You can't. I've tried. Maybe you've tried. I've, you know, I've tried. I've tried to do this myself, you know, buckle up, be, work harder, you know, mm, you, know, you know, buckle down and self-control and all stuff. You can't do it by yourself. We need each other. And this is one of the great failures of the American church is we don't think we need each other. We're all individuals. We're all doing our own thing. You all walked into church today and half of you probably said, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Oh, I'm doing great. Are you really? We, we hide from each other. We put on a facade. We put on a, a veneer. We don't really want to know. We don't, we don't want to open up. We don't want to, we want, we want to do that hard work of, uh, of that. We just want to go our own way and we'll, we'll take care of our own business. You know, a man takes care of his own stuff. He doesn't ask for help. And that's how we live our faith. 
But this says that we do this along together. We run together. We help each other. We're all struggling. We're all struggling in sin, and we need help emptying out and fleeing from sin. We need help filling up with goodness and godliness and pursuing righteousness. Sanctification is accomplished in community. We need each other to be an approved worker. Fifthly, the fifth trait of an approved worker is we teach and correct those in error uh, with gentleness. Boldly, but gently. Verse 24. Paul, writing to Timothy. Timothy, the Lord's servant. He's talking about Timothy. You, you're the Lord's servant. You must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. Able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, so that God may grant them repentance. The, the, you know, to be an approved worker, we're not argumentative. We avoid those things. We're kind to people. Doesn't mean we're pushovers. Doesn't mean we let people walk all over us. We stand for truth. We do correct people. We do argue. You know, there are things we should argue about. There are things we should debate. There are topics. There are truths we need to go to the mat on. But we don't do it in, in, a, in a wicked way. We don't do it in a mean way. We do it kindly. We know we're not going to quarrel about words and, and, and irreverent babble and controversies, but there are some things that we will argue about. We will argue truth, but we will do it in a kind way. Not to crush our opponent, not to beat them back, not to win an argument, but we do it so that God may grant them repentance, verse 25. And, and as an approved worker, we're not immature. Secondly, we're able to teach. We know God's word enough that we spent time in it, we've studied it, and we could teach it. How many of you have been Christians, don't raise your hand, how many of you have been Christians for more than a decade? More than 10 years, and yet if I said, go teach something out of the Bible, you say, oh, I can't, that's not my gift. No, 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 uh, teaching is a gift, and there are people that God gives, but every single one of us is called to be a teacher. Teach your children, to teach within your family, to teach in the, the body of Christ. If you've been a Christian and you've, you've rightly handled God's word like you should, you should be able to teach. I'm not saying you should be able to preach every Sunday, but you should be able to handle God's word in such a way that you can instruct other people in it. We're not immature. Thirdly, we're not impatient, we endure evil. We live in a time where people hate God's word, increasingly. We live in a time when, when people hate God's people, and, and we brought that on ourselves to a degree, degree too. We're not innocent in that. But we live in a time of increasing darkness when God's word and God's people are, are seen more and more in a negative light. And we must take the posture of endurance and patience, of endurance and patience, even in the midst of evil. That's the posture we need to have going forward in our country, the posture of endurance and patience. You know, other countries know this. They've lived this way. They've been under persecution from day one. I shared with you uh, on Easter Sunday, uh, or I, I guess it was after Easter, but Easter morning in Sri Lanka, there was a bomb that went off in a church building uh, to, to kill the, the worshipers there at Easter morning. You remember the story, right? Now, Christianity Today did an article, a follow-up article, and, and I found this amazing because the, the bomb went off when the Sunday school were coming up to church. And the lesson that day in Sunday school for the kids, you know what the name of the lesson was? Are you willing to die for Jesus Christ? Easter Sunday morning, the kids come into Sunday school, Jesus says, how many of you are able, can say, these are the kids, not even adults, would be willing to die for Jesus? Every single hand went up in that Sunday school class. And then they walked up the stairs and 16 of them paid the price, paid their, for their lives. Is that amazing? That made children, 16 out of the 26 people killed in that blast were children because they were coming up from that Sunday school class. In the Sunday school class where they just said, if, it, if need be, I am willing to lay down my life for Jesus Christ. And who knew that in a matter of minutes, that would come true? Evil. We live in an evil time. We live in an evil age. Are we able to be patient and endure evil? You know what Americans want to do when we face evil? You know what we want to do? Revolution. <laughs> We want to fight back. That's the way we're made. We want to fight. I'm not putting up with this. I'm not putting up with this. This is what the Second Amendment is for. To protect ourselves from what? The government. Let's go. I, I'm being facetious. There are times to make decisions, but we are, to, we are to endure patiently evil. Why? Verse 25 is why. So that God may perhaps grant repentance. Don't get mad at me about what I just said. It wasn't in my notes. It just popped in my head. So I don't know where it came from. So don't get mad at me. Don't email me. Or they say, don't at me. Don't at me. They say that. Don't at me. Right? That's on Twitter. Don't at me. No DM. Don't DM me on that one. Don't be harsh in correction, fourthly, but gentle. 
Again, this is the kindness, the gentleness. We should be known as people who love people, even people that hate us. We, we, we teach, we correct, but we do it gently. We do it with kindness. We, listen, this is a principle you have to understand. We are gentle and egalitarian towards people. We're all the same, made in the image of God. You should never attack a person who they are because we're all made in the image of God. We're all equal in that. What we attack is not people. We attack ideas. We attack ideas. We are not egalitarian when it comes to ideas. Not all ideas are equal. But people are equal. So you have to separate. We used to say this in the church. You separate the sin from the sinner. Right? The sin from the sin. It's harder and harder to do that. But that's what we do. We don't address people. We address the the ideas. We're not harsh. We are gentle. And fifthly, we're not pessimistic as Christians. But we are hopeful that God will grant repentance. There's that key verse 25. Correcting his opponents. Timothy, you're going to have to correct people. But do it with gentleness. Be bold. But be gentle and kind towards them. They're made in the image of God. Because when you're gentle and kind, in truth, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. And that, Timothy, and David's church is what it's all about. That we would be the instruments that God would use for repentance in people's lives. That is always the goal. That people would come to their senses. Verse 26, that people would be rescued from the snares of the devil and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do their will. That they would come to their senses. That's what an improved worker, they rightly handle the word of God. They're kind and gentle. They do correct, they do teach, but they do in such a way with with not pessimism, but hope that God may grant repentance to those people. We are on a, approved workers are on a rescue mission into this world. We are here to rescue those who have been ensnared by the devil. And our weapon that we use is the Bible, rightly handling God's worth. I put here, Satan is, not, is no match for an approved worker of God, rightly handling God's word. And this is our mission, to be an approved worker, rightly handling God's word. It is our calling. It is our commission. So the question I want to leave you with today is, are you an approved worker? Or are you an ashamed worker? Are you, appro- are you keeping your focus on God's word? Are you growing in God's word? Are you not getting distracted, but keeping your focus there? Do you love God's word? Is God's word like honey to your tongue? Scripture says, oh, it's like honey to my tongue, that you can't get enough of it, that you read it and study, that your goal in life is to know it. Do you stand on solid theological foundation of justification and sanctification? Are you consistently emptying yourself out of sin and filling yourself with godliness and fleeing sin and pursuing righteousness? Are you teaching and correcting with boldness but gentleness and kindness? These things aren't easy, but God has not called us to something easy. He's called us to be approved workers unto him. There's our challenge today. Are you an approved worker? Do you have God's stamp of approval? Or are you an ashamed worker who's not handling the word correctly? Doesn't even care about the word. Who's not spending time in the word. That are swept up into unhealthy conversations and controversies. That don't know theology. Don't know what the Bible teaches. They don't, you don't leave your sin. You're not emptying out sin. You're filling yourself up continually with sin. Even though you're a child of God, you've chosen to walk in rebellion to God. You can't teach. You can't correct. You're the one who needs to be corrected. Where are you? Are you what direction are you moving in? I pray today that you are rightly handling God's word and you are moving in that direction of being an approved worker and not an ashamed worker. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word today, and I thank you that your word has hope. It's the only place that we find hope in this universe, is in your word. And the hope is this, that God loves us so much that he gave his son to die for us. And that if we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we will be saved and have eternity with you, that we will get your stamp of approval and be saved and be brought into your kingdom, into your family, that we can call you a father, we call Jesus Christ our brother, and that we can know you and be clothed in the clothes of righteousness. For your name's sake, Lord, we can be saved completely to the uttermost, Lord. That's the hope that we have. And Lord, if we walk in that hope and we know that hope to be a reality in us and we know you as Lord and Savior and we don't doubt that, Lord, and we know that, Lord, then our call today is to be a proved worker, to go to work in your word, to pick up your word, to know it, to study it, to love people well enough to teach and correct them, but to do it with wisdom and gentleness and love, to not get caught up in all the nonsense in this world, but continue to walk in holiness towards you, Lord, to one day hear those words that we all want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, 
And Lord, we know that the road to be an approved worker as a Christian is full of potholes and it's full of detours and it's full of hazards, Lord, and it's hard. And, and sin is easily besets us and entangles us, Lord. Our desires lead us astray. Our temptations lead us into sin, Lord. We're so weak. We're so weak, Lord. And we're so undeserving of your grace and your love. But Lord, I thank you for your love that no matter where we are, no matter what we've been ensnared with, Lord, you are our Father and you are a good Father. And you come and you pick us up and you dust us off and you set us back on that road to be an approved worker, Lord. I pray today that we would leave with a desire, a renewed desire to walk in worthiness, to be an approved worker, to know your word, to love your word, to love people, Lord, to one day hear from you, well done, good and faithful servant, Lord. I pray that for myself, and I pray that for my brothers and sisters today, Lord. So I pray that you would bless us now as we go to communion as well, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I wanna ask our elders to come.